Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just last week, the Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government held a hearing with a vocal vaccine skeptic and known purveyor of medical misinformation amplifying his dangerous views for all the world to see. And now here we are, one week later, holding a hearing with verbiage that continues to undermine confidence in life-saving vaccines and call into question the science and policies behind the greatest tool we have in public health to protect against infectious diseases. So let me just say this again. If you don't have contraindications, COVID-19 vaccines are safe. They are effective in reducing risk to getting the virus. Therefore, more will be prevented. It will prevent more people from getting the virus. It is also effective in reducing the risk of getting really sick and by dying from COVID-19. The COVID-19 vaccine saves lives. We know this to be true because three years ago, we were in the darkest days of this pandemic and without the tools we needed to overcome this deadly novel threat. We were able to close this chapter of the pandemic thanks to the Biden administration's leadership in implementing the largest and most successful vaccine administration program in history. These policies, including vaccine requirements for high-risk healthcare workers, federal workers, and our service members, allowed us to safely reunite loved ones, reopen schools, businesses, and workplaces, enhance our military readiness, and reach the end of the public health emergency. Despite every effort QAnon and Republicans did to generate fear and undermine confidence in the vaccine, much like what we will most likely hear today in subtle or not subtle ways. So at the end of the day, it was in large part thanks to life-saving COVID-19 vaccines and the Biden administration's efforts to increase supply, access, and uptake that we were able to prevent the loss of another 3.2 million American lives, keep another 18.5 million people out of the hospital, and save our economy over $1 trillion in medical costs. We would not have been able to save lives or prevent severe illnesses and suffering without the policies in place that not only got vaccines out into the communities and to our most vulnerable, but also increased vaccination rates across the board to ensure a safe and responsible return to a more normal American life. So these public health measures enacted in support and in consultation with public health experts, doctors, and scientists from the federal uh, all the way down to the local levels have been proven to reduce harm and save lives. They were based on science and public health principles, not new and not arbitrary. In fact, the American Medical Association, American College of Physicians, American Academy of Family Physicians, American Academy of Pediatricians, and dozens of other distinguished medical groups and leaders have gone on the record in support of temporary vaccine requirements, under the context of, of course, a rapidly spreading deadly virus for their role in putting us through the darkest times of this, uh, pulling us through the darkest times of this pandemic and preventing additional loss of life. I say all this because as a physician, it is important to me that we start this hearing off on the right foot and with the facts. It's important to me that we are accurate when we discuss how and why these policies, which by the way have been deemed consistent with the First Amendment for over 100 years, were developed, supported, and guided by scientists, healthcare providers, and medical experts. This is so important to me because the American people are watching what we do here today. And when we sit from our highest perch in Congress with the loudest of megaphones and purposefully and intentionally sow doubt and mistrust and life-saving public health measures, the American people pay the price. We have seen what happens when we play with fire like this. The Brown School of Public Health, Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Microsoft AI for Health found a growing distrust in vaccines has caused more than 300,000 additional preventable COVID-19 deaths in the United States. What we say and how we say it matters. It can build confidence or it can manufacture distrust to deleterious effect. We're seeing diseases that we previously had under control like the chickenpox and measles pop up against up again across the country and we're seeing an overall decline in trust in vaccines throughout the country. According to the American Academy of Family Physicians, the rate of childhood for vaccination against measles, mumps, 
and rubella has decreased steadily since the 2019-2020 school year, leaving approximately 250,000 children unprotected against these dangerous diseases. A peer-reviewed study published in JAMA Internal Medicine also found that the excess death rates from COVID-19 after the approval of COVID-19 vaccines was 43% higher among Republican voters compared to Democratic voters. There's polls that are showing that the higher uh, hesitancy rate are within the white Republican male population versus any other group. So the extreme messaging and manufacturing distrust has a higher deleterious effect for those who hear it. We cannot deny the role of misinformation in fueling this troubling trend. In order to best serve the American people, Democrats, Republicans, independent, everyone, we must correct course and we must do it now. The way that we do that is not by holding hearings that wink and nod to extreme rhetoric that undermines confidence in vaccines. It's not by giving way to the anti-vaccines bills that are moving through state legislatures all across the country. And the fact is, no, it's not by calling for a blind trust in science either. It is by putting people over politics. It is by making sure people have access to accurate and timely information about the thoroughly proven safety and effectiveness of vaccines. It's by building a strong public health workforce that can help us get through the next pandemic and ensure previously eradicated threats don't come back. And it's by making sure that we as members of this body do what we can to protect the public's health now and into the future. And with that, I yield back.